Half-Life Alex, a game that made waves in the VR space because it was one of the first narrative-driven VR games that actually lasted more than 30 minutes. You won't find any of that room-scale wave mode crap here. No siree. What you have here is a full $60 AAA game offering a part horror, part action, fully-fledged campaign with 8 to 12 hours of engaging gameplay, immersive environments, and an enticing story. Now, I'll admit, when we first reviewed this game, I think it was two or three years ago, we weren't too impressed with it. But we played through the entire game again because we wanted to update that review, and I don't know what happened, but ladies and gentlemen, I have seen the light. I get it now. I am in love with this game, and uh, let me tell you why. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mac Cheese, the host of the Jetavision, and tonight we're reviewing Half-Life Alex. The story of Half-Life Alex is set after the Seven Hour War, where the mysterious multidimensional Universal Union, aka the Combine, defeated and subjugated Earth and the entirety of the human race in less than seven hours. Hence, you play as a woman named Alex, a member of the Resistance to this occupying force. Said Resistance managed to steal a piece of Combine tech, but before they can pick it apart and analyze it, the city goes into lockdown. This results in her father being captured captured and being sent to a prison. And with the help of your friend Russell, you're gonna get him back. So it's sent to the quarantine zone, a place where Zen, an alien planet, has sort of been leaking into, causing the entire place to be littered with alien flora and fauna, and a lot of gross little creatures. So the game starts out with you moving about this quarantine zone to save your dad, but later on you head towards this mysterious vault, theorized to hold a super weapon that can be used to fight off the Combine. So that's the story of the game, but how's it actually played? Very well, actually. The performance of this game is actually very good. It runs very smoothly. The frame rate stays consistently high, which is despite the graphics being the best I've ever seen in a VR game. Seriously, it's not a competition. The game simply looks the best. It's got a style, but it's also realistic enough to the point where it's one of the few VR games where I honestly feel like I'm almost there. I really hope that this kind of stuff can be replicated by other VR games in the future because I want to see more games like this. And obviously there's a lot of time in between episode 2 and Alex that allows this game to have such a huge breakthrough in quality, but I really feel as though the half life universe truly really comes alive in this game. If there's a cutscene, you're right in the middle of it. The Combine units look heavy and imposing. Barnacles look like they can chop your head clean off if they get a hold of you. The head crabs look big and fleshy, and you're genuinely terrified that they could latch onto your skull. The zombies with their split open stomachs look even more disgusting than they ever could have been, and they feel a lot more real. I feel like in previous Half-Life games, they've always kind of been comical, but in this game, they really come to life. Gameplay is best described as exploration and scavenging, broken up by the occasional hostile encounter. You'll move through levels, opening drawers, lockers, and digging through buckets for any goodies you can use. I really like the scavenging in this game. There's a lot of things that the game gives you to kind of rummage through, but it also doesn't feel tedious to do. You can search through and tear up a room in just a few seconds, take what you need, and be on your way. And I really like that levels are often littered with objects and furniture that the player can actually grab, pick up, or push around. This helps the game feel real, as if these are real objects, or this was a once inhabited location that people once occupied. There's a lot of levels like these, but my favorite example is probably the zoo level, specifically this break room, and just the way the furniture and objects are littered around the scene really helped the player to imagine a room that was once used by park employees to just kick back and relax on a break. What I'm getting at here is the game just does a terrific job of detailing its environments and making them feel like real places. Combat is generally good. Again, it mostly serves to break up the monotony of exploration to put something where previously an empty spot would have been. Now, I admit, I've never felt overwhelmed by the zombies or head crabs, even if those things really do scare the crap out of me. You can take them out pretty easily, and even if you need to reload or something, it's usually easy enough to fall back, or hell, you can really just teleport around them. But still, the creatures and monsters of Half-Life are fun enough to fight, especially when the game puts them in an environment that can make these encounters really shine. Now, I was a little less impressed by combat and involving combine units. You know, there is some strategy and movement, but I never really felt as though it required much action on the player's part. Gunfights are basically, you shoot at an enemy, the enemy shoots back, so you duck in the cover, you wait for the enemy to stop shooting, you pop out of cover, you shoot at that enemy, and then the enemy shoots back and you do it all over again. Just do that until everyone's dead. I mean, every now and then they try to close the gap or whatever, but at that point you just pull out the shotgun and blast them point blank. And I understand that combine soldiers are essentially genetically modified super soldiers who are probably wearing some damn good armor. But I could never get over their sponginess. Combine units take a surprising amount of hits to neutralize to the point where it's really not that satisfying to fight them. Generally, I like the combat that this game offers. It does add thrill and excitement to an area where previously it wouldn't have, but there's definitely room for improvement. As far as gameplay goes, the guns are done very well. Aiming and shooting, just, they, they, it feels right. And there's some pretty cool upgrades you could give to them as well. My favorites are these autoloaders you could put on the 
pistol and shotgun. They give the guns a very futuristic feeling, and it's just kind of cool to see them in action. And of course, the grenade launcher is a pretty fun attachment as well. And I like how the game actually bothers to animate the hands sliding the magazine into the pistol. You see the shotgun shells being crammed down the shotgun's barrel, and the battery being slapped into the SMG. Just that a lot of games don't really do that. They just kind of have the magazine get sucked into the gun, or just magically teleports inside. So it's a nice touch here that really helps with the immersion. The lack of body holsters is definitely a choice that this game makes, and I'm a little iffy on it because I kind of understand why they did it, but still, having to pull up a menu instead of instinctively drawing from a holster is kind of immersion breaking. It's also worth noting that there isn't any melee combat in this game, although the game is kind of set up in a way where it's not really necessary, so it's really not that big of a deal. Still, it would be nice to kind of sock a head crab right as he's launching himself at you. Also worthy of mention are the gravity gloves, a fantastic game mechanic. Aside from it being just a fun tool to plink around with, it's great because not everyone wants to go through the trouble of kneeling down in order to grab something that might be on the floor, so it definitely makes the experience a lot more comfortable. But really, I think most of the fun from Alex derives from just taking everything in, creeping through this section of the city that, despite being a shadow of its former glory and being subject to combine interference, gives you a glimpse into a past time. And the world was just a little more hopeful and a little less depressing. Although this game is set in modern day Bulgaria, each of the 11 levels offers something a little different. New scenery and situations for the player to get stuck in. Very little of the game actually feels like it's filler content, inserted just for the sole purpose of extending gameplay. There's a lot of great levels, but one level that stands out to me is probably the Northern Light Hotel one. Specifically this part where you're in the den of poison head crabs and they're just skittering all over the place. They're on the walls, floors, ceilings, they're coming out of toilets and stuff. It is just terrifying. You can't talk about the levels within Half-Life Alex without bringing up Jeff. The best level in this game, and probably one of the best designed levels in the entire history of gaming, it is the shining jewel of this game. It takes place in this abandoned distillery where there's this Venus flytrap looking zombie named Jeff, and in this level, you're just trying to get past him. He's blind, but he hears well. They're so constantly trying to avoid setting off anything that can make noise, all the while trying to grab some valuable loot here and there. And in this level, the game sets up all these scenarios that are just designed to really just screw over the player in one way or another, either by making certain puzzles requiring the player to attract Jeff's attention or forcing the player in a small confined space. Look, I really can't do this level justice by just explaining it to you. It is a tense, terrifying, and thrilling level. One of the best designed in the history of gaming. It's no wonder that when people talk about Half-Life Alex, this level always comes up. Now, there are parts of the game that I do consider to be weak or really of questionable design. I'll definitely say that while the ant lions are definitely a fun enemy to combat, sections involving them feel pretty arcadey, for lack of a better word. The game is slow-paced and encourages the player to really take in their surroundings, so it feels like the game takes a complete 180 by introducing them. I just think it's pretty unfortunate that ant lions are only introduced towards the end because by that time you've played through some of the more interesting levels, and with the introduction of ant lions, it feels like the game takes a step backwards. They're a fun enemy, but not really an interesting one because they aren't really used cleverly. The game just kind of throws them at you in these arena style areas of the map. You'll defeat a wave of ant lions only for some more to fly in not two seconds after, which can make these sections feel kind of cheap and lazy. I feel like if they were gonna go for this arcadey sort of approach, Ant Lion should have been introduced earlier in the game, where the player is kind of still unsure of what to expect. And, I take, I wasn't too fond of the lightning dog boss fights. I just think that they're a tedious enemy to fight. Basically, these lightning dogs are kind of variation of a head crab. They can crawl inside of zombies to control them and, and send out lightning attacks. It follows a very generic formula of boss attacks, exposes weak spot, shoot weak spot, and then the cycle repeats. It just feels like they drag on, and they just don't really feel unique, fun, or challenging. But those are just minor nitpicks at the end of the day. I wouldn't say that these are bad design choices, they're just choices that I question. And I still think the game's better off with these experiences than without them. But if there's anything that I do not like about this game, just straight up I hate about it, it's the puzzles. Oh, I'm sorry, puzzles, because they're really not puzzles. The game relies pretty heavily on arbitrarily designed hacking minigames to offer some sort of obstacle for the player to overcome. If you want to open a combine locker with loot inside of it, a door, a weapon upgrader, or defuse a trip mine, the game makes you play this dumb minigame to do so. They aren't cleverly designed or anything, they're just there. The game would be the complete same, maybe even slightly better without them. All these things do is just waste your time. The only thing they add to the game is a few minutes. The only hacking mini 
mini game I actually found myself liking is probably the one where you have to defuse a trip mine. But I found out you can totally bypass it by just throwing a random object into the laser. See, that's good game design, giving the player more than one way to solve a problem. Good on you, Valve. And then there's those wire mini games where literally all you have to do is connect one node to another by changing around some wire connections. And to its credit, at times it actually does manage to incorporate surrounding environments to it, but most of the time they're just too straightforward to offer any sort of real challenge or interest. I just wish that the game focused more on puzzles that actually incorporated the environment that you find yourself in. I don't want to wave a wand at the wall trying to find the node I have to spin around in order to hook up the power. I want to analyze my surroundings. I want to have that aha moment, and the game doesn't really have that. Overall, it's just kind of jarring to see this otherwise masterfully crafted game use such a cheap method to implement its puzzles. It could have and frankly should have done better. And let's face it, hacking minigames are just stupid. You're not gonna hack into someone's computer by guessing the right word. You're not gonna hack into a vending machine by choosing the right sequence of letters and numbers. And you sure as hell are not gonna hack into the technology of a hyper-advanced, multi-dimensional alien race using a magic techno wand that you cobbled together in your basement. Now, when we first reviewed this game, a point that we harped on was the replayability, or the lack thereof. The story is actually a very linear experience. When you play through the game once, you've seen everything it has to offer. And there's little to be gained by playing through the game again, unless you just like being a part of the game's universe to the point where that really doesn't matter, which is fair enough. Regardless, we were just disappointed by the price to playtime ratio. Granted, a game doesn't have to be long or infinitely replayable to justify its price tag, but the science, ladies and gentlemen, is simple. The longer one can enjoy a game, the more value you can take from it, which is why the Steam Workshop has been an absolute godsend for this game. That's right, it took them a while, but Half-Life Alex finally has Steam Workshop support. No need to bother with any third-party mod sites, you can just download them straight from the platform. And let me just say, this is a total game changer. You can change up the campaign by changing the models, be they guns or NPCs, but the real selling point here is the ability to download entire levels that other players have designed. I haven't really scratched the surface of the Alex modding scene, but from what I've played so far, I am sold on it. Now sure, the quality of these player-created levels is definitely gonna vary, but there's definitely some uh, good levels out there. I mean, not everyone's a master level designer, but still, what you now have is a near endless catalog of fresh original content for this game. If you were like me and didn't like that the lack of post-game content made it harder to get more mileage out of the game, well, those qualms can now safely be put to rest. All right, I think that's all I have to say about the game. Overall, there are small nitpicks and critiques that I have with the game. There is room for improvement, but overall, what we have here is an incredibly good title. The game looks great, runs great, it's one of the most immersive titles on the VR market, it's extremely polished, and while the game is of a decent length, the modding scene it has ensures infinite replayability and you'll just keep coming back for more. I give Half-Life Alex a 9.5 out of 10. Do I recommend it? Well, if horror doesn't make you squeamish, I'd say yeah, this is a pretty easy game for just about anyone to get into. Its design does a very good job of making sure that generally anyone, from new VR players to longtime veterans of the medium, can enjoy the game. And if you're someone who wants bang for his buck, this game can give it to you in ample quality and quantity. Now, as always, I'd wait for a sale because, well, this is Steam after all, you always wait for a sale. You never buy a game at full price, you always wait for a sale. But all in all, this is a must-have VR game. So, that's the review of Half-Life Alex. Now, if you're new here, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. If you want to keep up with our game and movie reviews, subscribe to the channel, follow the Twitter, and join the Discord. This is Mac Chista, Jetavision, signing out. You all have a good one.